नमस्कार 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 सारणी बहस शकुन तो तथ सारवी वुत के वे वर्चुअल इवेंट तो आई होप कि तुम तो सारी एंजॉय करान बिफोर वी स्टार्ट टुडे आई वुड लाइक टू से सारणी चु पंद ऑगस्ट इंडिया इंडिपेंडेंस डे मुबारक सारी सेलिब्रेट करान आज आज बड़ा ऑस्पिशस डे तो इस करो ये प्रोग्राम आज स्टार्ट विद बंदे मातरम तो अर्चना जी विल सिंग फॉर अस एंड तम पत् कर अर्चना जी इंट्रोड्यूस सुभाष जी एंड ही नीड्स नो इंट्रोडक्शन बट अर्चना जी विल इंट्रोड्यूस हिम एंड देन वी विल हैव अ टॉक विद सुभाष जी तो तम पत् बोग्राम तुम सोरी स्कड्यूल ब्रोक अगर तुम कें क्वेश्चन चो अगर कें हेल्प हेको कर कॉन्टैक्ट तो विद दैट नमस्कार अर्चना जी प्लीज गो हेड नमस्कार सारणी आज मुबारक दो आज इंडिपेंडेंस डे सेवेंटी थर्ड इंडिपेंडेंस डे ऑफ इंडिया सो आई कॉन्ग्रेचुलेट यू एंड माय ग्रीटिंग्स टू ऑल माय फेलो Indians as well as all the Kashmiri Pandit community on that um, day. So just to commemorate that day, I'm going to sing just one verse of Vande Mataram because we don't want to cut short on Subhash Ji's uh, conversation. I would, I'm not sure if one hour is enough for that, but I'll try my best to um, do what I can. <clears throat> वंदे मातरम वंदे मातरम सुजलाम सुफलाम मलयज शीतलाम सस श्यामला मातरम वंदे मातरम वंदे मातरम शुभ्र ज्योत्सना पुलकित यामिनी फुलकुसमिता तुम दल शोभिनी सुहासनी सुमधर भाषिनी सुखदावरदा मातरम वंदे मातरम वंदे मातरम सुजलाम सुफलाम मलयज शीतलाम सस श्यामला मातरम vande mataram thank you namaskar and i'm here today with subhash ji and um it is my honor to present him to my community we already know subhash ji subhash ji is a computer professional a uh, computer scientist by profession a regents professor of computer sciences in oklahoma university he completed his early education in um iit delhi and also a phd in iit delhi he is an authority on quantum computing artificial intelligence cryptography he has written extensively about 20 books he has written about uh, the history of science um especially in the indian sciences and has written about 20 books he has about 20 publications Subhashi has been awarded a Padma Shri in 2019, and our community is honored to have him um, as um, a member of our KP community. He serves as a member of the PM's uh, Council on Science, Technology, and Innovation. We are privileged to have him today on the, on the program. Namaskar, Subhashi. Namaskar, Namaskar, Archana Ji. Namaskar, Shakunji, and the. Uh, 
uh, KOA for giving me this opportunity to speak. And that was a beautiful rendition of Vande Mataram. Truly oh, inspirational. Very, very nice. What I'm going to do, since we have only an hour, I'll start with just a few remarks on Kashmir's uh, contributions to world culture and uh, the whole uh, world of uh, ideas, uh, art and other subjects. And then uh, Archana Ji has told me that there are a few questions and we'll just uh, dive into them. And these questions, I've seen some of them uh, in advance, cover a whole variety of uh, subjects uh, in all the sciences. Now, Kashmir's uh, contribution to Indian culture and world culture encompass so many subjects ranging from uh, linguistics as in Mahabhashya and uh, Patanjali to yoga because Patanjali of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra uh, was a Kashmirian. Certainly the Mahabhashya Patanjali was a Kashmirian and most scholars accept that uh, there was only one Patanjali who did not only these two subjects, but also made fundamental contributions to Ayurveda, as in uh, Charak Samhita. And then uh, we had uh, uh, the whole discipline of aesthetics and art, as in the great Vishnu Dharmotar Puran, which gives you the entire aesthetics and uh, the way of defining art that was composed in Kashmir, maybe in the third or the fourth uh, century of CE. And then uh, we, of course, do have the entire Kashmir Shaivism tradition. The Kashmir Shaivism is a very sophisticated and very, very modern way of looking at the ultimate mystery of what reality is. And it addresses it from the question of what is consciousness? And the moment you do that, uh, all questions related to who are, where, where questions related to who God is, how we are free, all those questions are part of the narrative of Kashmir Shaivism. And they were very great uh, uh, philosophers, uh, ranging from uh, right in the beginning, and then you have Utpal Dev, then you have, um, uh, we have Shemendra, then we have, of course, the great Abhinav Gupta, and many, many others. And this continued to the much later period where we have the great Laleshwari, for example, who was uh, speaking of the same insights as were a part of the Kashmir Shaivai tradition. I can tell you that right now, some of the leading minds in the world in various subjects, including physics, are looking at these ideas. And then, of course, we have literature. We had uh, Abhinav Gupta also write a very famous commentary on uh, the Bhagavad Gita. He also wrote a book along with uh, Anandavardhan. A book, you know, Anandavardhan was before him, called Dhvanya Lok. Uh, and Dhvanya Loka is a book on the idea of Dhvani which is a theory of aesthetics. How do we see beauty in a piece of art or music? And these questions were addressed in a very sophisticated way. Now, there's also uh, the idea that there were fundamental contributions in art and architecture. And many of the innovations that we see in the Far East, in uh, China and Japan, in architecture are to be traced back to what was created in Kashmir during the Karkot and many other dynasties. Uh, and this is the view of the leading historians of art. So really multi-dimensional uh, and literature. And in my view, the greatest novel that's ever been written in the whole uh, corpus of world literature. And some people call it scripture. It's longer than, uh, longer than Ramayana and, and shorter than, of course, the Mahabharata. And this is Yoga Vasishta, which all scholars believe was written in Kashmir. And it's about 29,500. Amazing, amazing book. There are very readable translations of it. 
published by State University of New York Press, two abridged versions, one smaller than the other. Uh, very engaging. So I do recommend that book, which anyone, uh, whether they are in high school or college, would enjoy reading. And this book, uh, apart from being a wonderful story, also touches on the most subtle questions that one could have on reality. So with this, I will stop and then we can come on to actual questions that some of uh, which have already been sent to you. Yes, so uh, thank you, Subhaji, for that overview. Um, I do know that you touched um, very slightly on two of the questions already. One was uh, basically the contribution of um, India, ancient India, obviously in astronomy, mathematics, um, science, you know, um, medical sciences, so we have Shushutra and stuff. So uh, that one was that question, we'll probably come to that. Also the question on what books um, we uh, should read about knowing more about how India has contributed. So we'll come to that. So let me first start with, um, uh, you know, a little overview on Vedas. So um, Einstein, who has been the greatest scientist of the century, once uh, mentioned that I believe in uh, Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in lawful harmony of all that exists. So we talk more about pantheism. And um, Einstein basically mentioned that he uh, believes that God in the law of nature and the law of universe. And Vedas say the same thing. We have said that for millennial centuries now. So could you please touch on that? Absolutely. Uh, it so uh, happens that I worked on the Vedas quite a bit in the early 90s. I wrote a book called The Astronomical Code of the Rig Veda, which is also freely circulating on the internet. So you can take a look it at is. it. Yeah. So uh, I've studied it from many different perspectives. I also studied the whole question of who the devatas are, for example, the gods within. And let me speak of the devatas. You know, uh, what can happen if there is injury to the brain, one can lose the capacity to read, but one can still write in some cases. And this is, there is a certain module in the brain which uh, is uh, regarding or which concerns the ability or the capacity to read. And there's a separate module which uh, governs the capacity to write. So just like this, there are all these capacities which are given the names of the various dev devatas. So the devatas mm -hmm. hold up the inner sky. You know, what's mm -hmm. interesting is that there's no light inside the brain, but we still see things. The, the brain is yes. totally dark, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And the, the light signals are transformed into electrical impulses mm -hmm. go into all the neurons that constitute the brain. And the brain has almost as many neurons as are the stars in the entire cosmos. So how does recognition take place? How, does, how do memories work and so on? Uh, what the devas are, the centers, the cognitive centers inside the brain. But then, as you, uh, Arjunaji, uh, correctly pointed out, the Vedas recognize that there are laws. And in Sanskrit, that's called rit. Rit, and in fact, from that word comes rite, R-I-T-E. Rit mm -hmm. is what is according to laws. So everything is according to law, laws. Then the question would be, how do we have freedom? Why aren't we just zombies as some uh, contemporary scientists have concluded that uh, we could not be free and therefore we are only zombies. We have this idea that uh, consciousness is like a shadow. But you know, that doesn't seem reasonable at all. Yeah. So modern science has come to some kind of a dead end. So what is the Vedic resolution? The Vedas provide an amazing resolution. The Vedic resolution is that there is a single consciousness. There is the physical universe, which we are part of. We are also <laughs> animals, physical animals. But there is also consciousness which transcends, which is not uh, constituted by matter. And there is a single uh, consciousness, just as there is a single sun. And the same sun can shine in a million different pots of water, right? And you'll have the same orb in each pot of water. So. Mm -hmm. 
there is a single consciousness and it's that consciousness which shines in the minds of every human being and every sentient being. Now, uh, what we do is, so the awareness is the same, but we have access to it only through our mind. So mind is an instrument, unlike the Western view, where mind itself is awareness. In the Vedic view, mind is only an instrument. And we should all be geniuses if we were not separated from that source of awareness within us. Because what we do is this mind uh, covers itself through various coverings, which are a consequence of conditioning or habits and perhaps the emotions that we are born with, emotions mm -hmm. and so on. So it gets clouded. Right. Mm -hmm. If you are not clouded, if you could make it calm, mm -hmm. the lake of the mind calm, which in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra is Chitta Vritti Nirodha, then we will have access to all the capacities that are within us. And this then completely resolves this whole question of how we have freedom. Because consciousness does give us the freedom because it's outside of matter and time and space. So this is a most sophisticated and relevant uh, resolution, which is still of value, which is why scientists all across the world are attracted to the whole Vedic system. And which is precisely what uh, Kashmir Shaivism also speaks of, that mm -hmm. each one of us is Shiva in our true self. And it's because we have forgotten that we are Shiva and we think we are just our animal nature we are right. connected to our instincts, which is the source of all our unhappiness and grief. So mm -hmm. not only would we realize what we can do, and we'll realize that we can do much more than what we thought we could do, but we'll also find ways to deal with emotional distress. We'll also know how to have mastery over what can be done. And in the Bhagavad Gita, there is a statement by Krishna where he says, Yogaha Karmasu Kaushalam, which means yoga is finding perfection in all that we were Shiva, then we would find that perfection in action. And, right. you know, wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be wonderful. That, especially in these times, right? where um, there's a lot of distress in the world and you know so it would all it would be so nice to find that inner peace somewhere um i am just going to ask a more uh, a scientific question which is obviously your expertise and um, about quantum mechanics so we have in the past century basically dissected the you know the Ma what the matter is made of, the atoms, the subatomic particles, and this and that. And there's a string theory, this and that. I'm, I'm not into physics that much, but I have read a little bit. So talk to us about the quantum mechanics, the unified field of matter, and what Vedas wrote about them. What, how, where have they mentioned, the Vedas have mentioned all this centuries back, and we are in you know, this century talking about it now. So talk about that briefly for, uh, for okay, us. Okay, very briefly. Uh, uh, the creator of quantum mechanics was a Austrian named Erwin Schrodinger. Erwin Schrodinger mentions in his autobiography, which he wrote in the 1950s, that mm -hmm. when uh, in the 20s, 1920s that is, there was this crisis of physics and they could not explain why the negatively charged electrons uh, keep on uh, flying around the positively charged nucleus and why don't they fall into the nucleus, right? Because right. negative and positive charges attract each other. So there's this big crisis and then finally the resolution of it came through the structure of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And Schrodinger in his autobiography says that the central idea of quantum mechanics came to him from the Upanishadic Mahavakya or the great statement I am Atma Brahma. One of the Upanishadic Mahavakyas is that this Atman is the entire cosmos, which means that this Atman, which is small, right? Which is within each one of us, right. constitutes the entire universe. That gave him the central idea that 
the quantum state should be a superposition of all possibilities. That is the central idea of quantum mechanics. Right. That uh, the micro world state is a superposition of all possibilities. The other idea is that when you interact with a quantum state, it collapses to one of those possibilities. Hmm. Now, according to historians of science and historians of quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics is totally consistent with Vedanta. Erwin Schrodinger himself was a Vedantin. Wherever he would go, he would take Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita with him, which are two uh, of the uh, mm -hmm. main uh, sources of Vedanta. And in uh, quantum mechanics, you also then have this paradox that how does, in quantum mechanics, until you interact with the system, the system evolves deterministically, but then you interact with it, it, it collapses to one of the possibilities. Now, there is a similar uh, debate, and it's a very ancient debate in Indian thought, which is that if everything is according to physical law, mm -hmm. then how is divinity, uh, whether you call divinity Vishnu or Shiva or the goddess, how is divinity able to make any impact? Why should we even pray or why should we do anything at all, right? Because everything right. is according to physical Absolutely. law. Mm -hmm. So they came up, with a, came up with a beautiful resolution and the resolution is called Drishti Srishti Vad. And mm -hmm. what it says is that Shiva, by his Drishti alone, by, by looking at something is able mm -hmm. to create Srishti, from Drishti comes Srishti. Oh. Now, my friend, the great Indian physicist who died last year uh, from Kerala by name George Sudarshan, mm -hmm. in 1970s, he wrote a paper along with his student. And he says that by observation alone, the experimenter can, can change the state of the quantum state, which is really Drishti Srishti. And this has been shown in the lab it's one of the frontier areas of quantum mechanics that indeed this amazingly sophisticated idea and this idea also any other aspects of Indian thought, including some of you may have heard of something called uh, Sri Vidya. Sri Vidya, it's mm -hmm. believed, arose in Kashmir and now it's popular all across the country. Sri Vidya is a model of the inner cosmos and the outer cosmos also. Mm -hmm. And it has uh, many, triangles, in fact, 43 triangles, uh, nine triangles, which constitute 43 triangles. And it's rather complicated. I, I won't go into the details. And they represent Prakriti. And in the middle is a small dot who represents Shiva. Shiva. And the whole idea is this, that if you analyze systems, you will see that you can explain everything in terms of natural transformation. And you will not find the source of awareness in any of these systems. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those paradoxical things that right. the more you look for Shiva directly, the more Shiva sort of disappears. Because, yeah. and why does it happen? Because you yourself are Shiva. Do you see that? The more yeah. you try to look for Shiva outside, you won't find Shiva outside. It's Shiva inside is you. within. It's inside you. And this is, again, right. expressed right in the Vedas where it's stated there are two kinds of knowledge, which are called apara and para. Apara right. is linguistic knowledge of outside things. Mm -hmm. While para, para meaning transcendent, is the knowledge of the experience itself, really? who is Shiva himself. So mm -hmm. all there are these amazing threads. As far as back, you can go into the text. And uh, it's incredible that people should have been thinking of such subtle things. We, are, we really need to right. be very proud of it, not because it came from there, but because ultimately this is where all of the humanity should go. You know, these are it's questions going. which yeah. confront everybody. All human beings are the same. Every human being wants knowledge. Everybody wants to be connected to truth. And in Kashmir Shaivism, of course, in contrast to certain more, uh, uh, more traditions within India, which were more to do with renunciation that, hey, you go into the forest and you do your tapasya and you'll get knowledge. What Kashmir Shaivism says is that this embodied universe, this world, mm -hmm. is also an expression of Shiva. 
Right. And therefore, this itself can be a source of knowledge. You don't have to exactly. run away. You don't have to exactly. be a sannyasi. You can be Enjoy. a grihasti. Mm -hmm. You can be a person of the world. Mm -hmm. And the beauty that there is in the world can also be inspirational to you to connect you to the highest truth, which is the reason why in Kashmir, there was so much of emphasis on beauty, mm -hmm. on music, on the arts, that these are vehicles. You don't have to do just, you know, abstract thought and equations and so on, that through the arts, also the highest truths can be apprehended. And isn't that a shame that we started with that philosophy and then over the next five, 600 years that all was lost? You know, um, in, in you know, since 1300s to I guess about 18, 1900s, 1800s at least, um, the art, the dances, the music, that was all decimated. You know, and that now we are probably seeing the resurgence of it. But uh, what a shame! Um, I do it was one... forbidden. Yeah, exactly. in fact, some of the some of the greatest artists then left Kashmir. They went to. Himachal Pradesh and Nepal, and some of the mm -hmm. most beautiful uh, bronzes, pieces of sculpture, sculpture, the great Pahadi paintings. Mm -hmm. Many of them very Kashmiris who went down to Himachal and Kangra and other right. places. And, right. and they are world-class styles of, uh, of, of art. So, but so it's coming back, you know, history has this, uh, has, has cycles. And there are bad Absolutely. periods, and maybe these bad periods are to shake us up, to wake us up from, um, for, from taking things for granted. Uh, and of That's course, we have true. also suffered very deeply in the last 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And maybe out of that suffering, something new would emerge. Good will come Who out. Abs absolutely. So um, we have uh, touched on how Kashmir was um, basically a cradle of knowledge. I mean, from Kashmir, knowledge went to various parts of India, not only India, to the world. Uh, talk to us about that. Like, what is the, uh, what was the basis of Ayurveda, of yoga? Some of that, okay. Yeah, just briefly, let us see what Kashmir actually gave the world. Yeah, I, I will just uh, speak of two things. Uh, we, we've already mentioned uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. and Patanjali is supposed to have been from Kashmir because we know from the references within Patanjali's Mahabhashya mm -hmm. that he's talking about these villages in Kashmir, that exactly. he lived there, and mm -hmm. the Patanjali's are the same. But something that is not so widely known, mm -hmm. which is of the greatest importance in history of ideas, and history of the world is that there was a twin region to Kashmir just north of the Himalayas, which was called uh, Khotan uh, mm -hmm. and all of what is Xinjiang, where mm -hmm. Kashmirian languages were spoken mm -hmm. and where uh, there were also Kashmirians who lived there. There was great scholars like the Kashmiri scholar Kumarji, uh, mm -hmm. I think in the third century. And there were all these hundreds of thousands of scholars who went to Xinjiang, which was very close to the then capital of China called Chang'an. And mm -hmm. what the Chinese had done were to set up huge translation bureaus of hundreds of thousands of scholars who took Sanskrit texts and translated them into Chinese. And classical Chinese civilization arose there in this twin region of Kashmir in Khotan. Right. And in fact, their names were also Kashmiri. Kashgar, for example, was Kashi Giri, hmm. the hill of light. And Sanskrit was spoken there. So Kumar Jeev, as one of the scholars, uh, he, he wrote the Lotus Sutra, which is the central text of Mahayana Buddhism. And he gave it a Vedantin spin. So Kashmir gave a twist to Buddhism as it was practiced then, and there was a lot of ferment going on in North India, and gave it a Vedantic spin. And with that, Buddhism was taken to China. And so mm -hmm. Chinese civilization as we know it, 
and Chan and Chan became Zen. Dhyan became Chan, Chan became Zen. And classical Japanese civilization also owe a lot to this crucible that was Kashmir and its twin region, which was Khotan and uh, Xinjiang. And it remained Sanskritic until 1007. And in 1007, Turkic tribes from north of Xinjiang conquered it. And then over the next few centuries, it became Islamicized and Turkified. So they lost mm -hmm. their language. But then before it went down, they had safeguarded all their texts in caves. And mm -hmm. these caves were discovered 100 years ago. And so mm -hmm. now we have the entire history of those 1,000 years to which wow. Kashmir made an amazing contribution mm -hmm. in so many different ways, which we Kashmiris need to be connected once again to. Absolutely, absolutely. We need to do so much more uh, than just uh, being connected. We need to basically, uh, you know, collect all that literature and archive it and, you know, um, talk about it, put it in a print or, you know, electronic media, whatever. We need to, we need to get uh, a lot of work done. Um, a few questions from the audience which have been sent to me. One is from Rohit Raina from Zone 5 and he is asking what books would you recommend to read and learn about the origins of Hinduism and how it is tied to early astronomy and mathematics? So that is his question. Well, uh, since I already spoke about that book called The Astronomical Code of Eric Veda and it's mm -hmm. on the internet, uh, you can download it for free. Uh, and that gives a summary and you will have a lot of citations or references at the back, which you can explore. Uh, and I've written, I don't know, 30, 40 different journal articles on it, which are also on the internet. Or if you go to my Twitter page, there is a link there, which gives a list of many of those papers with hyperlinked, uh, hyperlinks to the text directly. So this will be an easy way out, no cost attached here, and then you can explore it for yourself. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, the Vedic Rishis knew, which was forgotten for about 2000 years or maybe longer, was the, which is a resolution to this question that some of you may have asked your mother, or grandfather, or maybe your mother or father, do the Japamala, it has 108 beads in it, right? You, mm -hmm. you speak your mantra or the name of the god or the goddess 108 times. Mm -hmm. You might have wondered why 108, right? So the Vedic Rishis knew about it and the reason why they chose 108 uh, hid a very subtle secret. And the secret is this. They found that the sun uh, and the moon each are 108 times their respective diameters from the earth. And in fact, modern astronomy has also shown that the diameter of the sun is about 108 times the diameter of the earth. Now, as I already mentioned to you in the beginning, uh, the whole idea in Vedanta or Kashmir Shaivism is that there is one Shiva who is within each one of us mm -hmm. reflected like the sun. There's one sun reflected in the mirror of our minds of each one of us, right? So uh, since the entire cosmos, I talked about uh, Schrodinger being inspired by the Sanskritic Mahavakya, I am Atma Brahma, right? That the Brahman is within the pind, which is the body, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. idea is that just as the outer Brahman has the sun, the inner Brahman has Shiva within, right? So just as to reach the sun, you must make a symbolic journey of 108 diameters of the sun to reach the sun, right? Right. To reach the inner sun, you must make the symbolic journey of taking the name of right. Shiva or the goddess or Vishnu or Krishna mm -hmm. 108 mm -hmm. times, right? So that 108 is being done by going through the Japamala or if you chant 108 times. You know, this is that secret or there are 108 teeth stands. If any of your daughters or uh, boys has done Bharatanatyam, Bharatanatyam yeah. has 108 karanas, 108 yes. dance poses. So That's these true. secrets were expressed in a multi, Physical. multitude of ways. That here 
ask these questions or <laughs> ask the question why is ganesha riding a mouse right uh, you not to take it literally because whatever in hinduism or in the vedas you take it literally then you get stuck there yeah all of vedas is a sequence of questions it's a conversation sure so one leads to another leads to another and as you do that each of that conversation changes you that is what punar janma is all about punar janma is transformation in this life and as you do that you become a different person you become free of the previous sanskaras those sanskaras are like the uh, like the blink the blinders or the mm-hmm. blinkers or the blinders that the horse has you know you're in a horse sure. carriage the horse sure. has those blinders Channel so vision, the yeah. sanskaras are blinders you can only see that much so if you do this process of sadhana and there are lots of many hymns and other things which are a part of our tradition especially in kashmir kashmir was such an extraordinary place i grew up in srinagar for example and i knew and you know my grandmothers and older women and others they were full of such extraordinary wisdom and Absolutely. one of the challenges how do we how do we get connected to that this was yeah. truly an amazing place where people were kind and wonderful and accepting and how do we do that again for the entire world because the world is lost right now Absolutely. the western neo liberal model doesn't seem to work and young people are extremely unha- unhappy they are rioting because there are no jobs you know with this ai revolution there will be no jobs they are scared mm-hmm. for their future mm-hmm. and there are all these temptations of drugs and other addictions many people are killing themselves you know opioids and so on not because there's anything wrong with them because they don't know what life is all about and that's so what true. our kashmir was all about we need to do and it not just for ourselves but for the entire world that's so true i mean the the core of our philosophy or religion is harmony it's harmony with the inner self harmony with the outside world live in peace and let live. and that that's what uh, our religion is all about uh but we do see that um our youth on or even like you know our generation turning away from that religion they are uh, do not want to be associated and boxed in uh with the name of a particular religion i wouldn't say only hinduism you know maybe even christianity so what is it that will get the youth more interested and involved in religion and um it seems to uh, this is a question from sangam tikku zone 9 he is asking it seems that the audience for most of these talks as i guess today is um older individuals you know why is it that we get connected to religion and ask questions mm-hmm. as we age why don't the young ask these questions the curiosity should be at an earlier age why is that well two reasons firstly uh, textbooks that kids read are giving this false notion to the kids that everything is known that science knows everything which is false as we know uh, science is facing a huge crisis physics itself is a is facing a crisis physicists are being forced to postulate 95% of dark matter and dark energy because they mm-hmm. can't explain why stars and galaxies are going at speeds that they are which is, are not supported by either newton's laws of gravitation or einstein's law of gravitation physics is hiding this all and why does physics hide it because science is afraid of religion because science feel that religion for many centuries put europe and the rest of the world in dark ages because they said you can't question because christianity already has all the answers or maybe islam has all the answers so the world entered a period of dark age so in order to confront it so what school books tell you is that everything is known which is not mm-hmm. true because not just physics there is this crisis in neuroscience where is awareness inside the brain there is no neural correlate of neuroscience yeah. how do you have freedom in psychology why does uh, this brain the the brain machine uh, conscious and why the silicon machine is not conscious if these questions were also 
a part of the curriculum in school and college, then kids would be excited. They would say, hey, I want to be one of those guys who finds answers to these questions. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why Americans are so off science and off education is because education is doing a very poor job. So a part of the challenge is for us parents to tell children that, look, science is an open-ended adventure. There are huge questions that confront the world and you can be a part of it. And it so turns out that many of these questions are a part of our own tradition. Isn't it amazing that in this mysterious paradoxical way, the most ancient and the most modern have come together. So it's not religion like dogmatic religion. Hinduism mm -hmm. is not dogma. Hinduism is all about questioning. Uh, yeah. And so uh, we are not talking of religion. Religion as dogma, that's not, we, we don't even approve of that ourselves. So, hey, leave religion and come to questioning. This is a table for questioning and the youth should be asking questions. In fact, when I give my lectures to my young students, sometimes undergraduate, they love it. I talk about all of this. They love it. And, they are, and then you discover that they are actually very bright. Uh, their eyes become dull. They go to other courses where they are being told there's nothing to know and just memorize this. And they say, exactly. what is this? This is nonsense because I don't have to memorize it. It's already at my fingertips. I can question, I can Google it. So why yeah. am I wasting my years, right? Absolutely. And those are very valid questions. Yes, they are not given the opportunity of being curious, of asking questions and so on and so forth. But I think that um, the system of education needs to change, you know, everywhere in the world. It's just textbooks and stuff. I think that students need to, they need to research, they need to ask questions. So that's how science and, you know, that will, will have answers to many, many more questions. There is a question on, um, from Ravinder Ji. Um, he's asking, where does religion come from? And why would you urge someone to be either a Christian or a Hindu or um, anything? Why? And then why is there an urge to be secular? I, I'm not sure if um, these questions are connected, but it's definitely about religion. Why box yourself in? And why do we have to follow um, something like a secularism? The word religion, I think, comes from a Latin word, which means to bind. Mm -hmm. So for Christianity, there was no such religion. Uh, there, there was open-ended tradition, let's say, in the ancient world. And uh, in India, there's no um, synonym for, uh, in any of the Indian languages. Um, the word Sanatan Dharma, for example, mm -hmm. is the perennial way, the, ancient, the way of the truth. So Sanatan Dharma, I think the best way to uh, translate this would be the way of the truth. It's not, right. it's not dogma. It's not dogma at all. Now, uh, what's interesting is that when you go to uh, the ancient world, uh, I spoke of China and Japan to the east through, uh, through this twin region north of Kashmir, which was part of Kashmir in a certain, in a larger sense. And I've written some essays on it, which you might want to explore on medium.com. But there's also a movement to the left. You go to the ancient Slavs, the Russians and the Poles and so on. They also worshiped Vedic gods. And uh, they, have, they have Shiva and Rudra and all that, which after they were Christianized, and they were Christianized only about a thousand years ago, they were forcibly separated from that because mm -hmm. these gods are really ways, abstractions to represent the truth, right? For example, Shiva right. is an abstraction. Shiva is really not somebody who, who's sitting on the top of a mountain. It's Shiva is within each one of us, right? Sure. So these, what, what Hinduism represents or what the Vedas represent are uh, a the world of knowledge. They are not dogma because knowledge ultimately is self-experiential. So there are certain um, mild posts you are given, a signpost that, hey, this is what you will experience. Cover your true self uh, by yourself. And this mm -hmm. is what you can do, or this is the way of, of, of journey. 
Now, the whole idea of secularism came to uh, Europe because in Europe, civil society after the scientific revolution of three or 400 years ago, were consciously fighting Christianity because mm -hmm. before that Christianity had bottled up all thought, all questioning. Mm -hmm. So they said some questions will not be entertained, will not be a part of the uh, civil sphere and administration will all be about governance and religion, religious issues are to be sep done separately. Now, sadly in India, without awareness of what Hinduism was about after mm -hmm. 1947, what the Indian government did was to put Hinduism in the same or a similar category as say Christianity or Islam, mm -hmm. but they bottled up Hinduism because Hinduism is really not a religion. If you really ask me, exactly. you and me, yeah. it's open inquiry. So they mm -hmm. said, whatever are Hindu sciences, you know, you have all these darshanas, all the yoga, all Jyotish and so on. Not, I'm not talking about astrology, I'm talking about astronomy. They said that's also Hinduism. So that was also banished from the textbooks. So in the last 70 years, not true before that, before that, some of the greatest Indian scientists and scholars were, were fairly knowledgeable about Hinduism as well. Mm -hmm. But in the last 70 years, we have done a lot of harm to our right. own culture and civilization by alienating our own people um, from this tradition, which is universal. We're, universal. we're not Absolutely. saying that you believe in this or that. We are all saying, hey, this is where Vedanta is questioning what the nature of reality is, or yoga is questioning what the nature of your inner self is, or Vaisheshika is questioning how uh, humans are able to make sense of the outer world. So we have separated our people from us. By doing so, we have diminished our people. Absolutely. Uh, and, and in order to find all the capacities that should be our birthright, I think we, there is a challenge. And the challenge is how do we get the youth connected to it in a positive way, not as dogma. I'm the last person to speak of dogma. And I see a lot of interest in the youth these days. It's just that they need direction. They need information. They need to be given, they need to be led to that path where um, they will have resources uh, like, you, you know, Rohit um, uh, Ji has asked what book? So that's the start. So I think that's all the more reason that you should be coming on these programs more to guide our youth. Um, and it is also an understatement that whatever recognition um, we have gotten is if in the West, they talk about yoga now, now which has become universal. But before that, I don't think in India, yoga was that much revered. I mean, it's just now that on world stage, now we are recognizing the benefits and of yoga. So why is it that we shy away as Indians? We shy away from what we should be proud of. And we almost want the West to validate it first before we kind of talk about it or even like are proud of it. Why is that? That's uh, because of the fact that uh, ideologically we took a certain position which was not well informed. You know, there's something called the Stockholm syndrome. Mm -hmm. The victim eventually identifies with the with oppressor. Yes. The, from 1800 to, uh, to the time that the British left, India's share of the world economy went from 25% to 1.4%. Mm -hmm. and, and the British, was, in other words, according to certain economists, the British stole about 47 trillion dollars worth of Indian yep. wealth. And when they left, they said, look, it happened to you because you have caste. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the Indians, because, because of suffering from Stockholm syndrome, we said, yeah, yeah that's what it yeah. is. It's yeah. not that you have stolen our wealth well. or you have separated us from our knowledge. So mm -hmm. now we must fight each other and somehow thereby we'll be able to solve our problems. So yeah. this was a simplistic Marxist view, mm -hmm. uh, which was adopted by the politicians and mm -hmm. sadly by academics who were perhaps not very well informed. But fortunately, you know, the past is past. We can't change it. Right. Fortunately, all these things are coming to light and people are recognizing what happened. And 
And in a certain sense, the part doesn't matter. The only thing that is, is now. It's for us to seize the day as in the Latin motto, carpe diem, you know, seize the day. For yeah. us, yeah. Mm -hmm. you young guys, seize the day. The future belongs to you. Absolutely. In um, almost um, kind of that tone, I, I would ask that there's a question from Manju Chandra um, from Zone 3. Why do you think the internet is flooded with misinformation about Kashmir and our exodus? Why have we not, as a community, produced significant literature <clears throat> which would be considered a source of vital information in understanding um, the cultural standing of Kashmir? The answer to that is uh, right now, uh, there is, uh, you know, there's the left. Let's look at what are the various big political parties in the world. There is the left and the left for various reasons. The left is anti-religion, of course. Uh, they want to break down Christianity as well. Uh, and their main, their big enemy outside of the West is Hinduism because Hinduism uh, has uh, the claim that Hinduism presents also a way to reality. You know, mm -hmm. the progressives say that theirs is the only way to reality. We are only bodies and then we have society, etc. And that's the way to go. But here are these guys. Who are these guys? Who are they? What are they talking about yoga and this nonsense stuff? Mm -hmm. And they claim they have a way to reality as well. So they also detest Hinduism, right? They detest right. Christianity. It's too close-minded. What's this thing about miracles and rising from the dead? And they also detest Islam. But right now, in order to bring down Christianity and bring down Hinduism, there is what is called a green-red alliance, alliance of the left and the Islamists. Mm -hmm. And for their purpose, uh, because of this alliance, uh, they are not, they don't care what happened to the Kashmiri Pandits. There is a small minority, they are gone. So it doesn't, even if we had the greatest literature on the web, they would say, hey, you know, you are whistling in the air. It doesn't really matter. Look at Kosovo. Mm -hmm. The Serbs consider Kosovo uh, the, the heartland of their spiritual past, but it doesn't right. matter. Now it's Islamic. So we have to accept reality. And they're doing it in Lenin's famous phrase, uh, useful idiots for each other. You know, once they obtain power, it's like what happened in Iran when the revolution took place, when Khomeini conquered Iran, right, you know, the yeah. Shah was mm -hmm. displaced. Mm -hmm. The yeah. first thing they exterminated was the left. Was the left. They destroyed them. Although the left had been their allies prior to the revolution. So this mm -hmm. is this drama unfolding. And right. we are, we don't hate anybody. The left, the Islamists, everybody, they are also human beings. They have, we have certain knowledge that we have uh, and it's universal knowledge and we offer it to everybody. They are also our brothers and sisters. That's at <laughs> least my perspective. And we say to them, take, question it, uh, go into yoga, do all of this. If you don't like it, move away. But it has beauty yeah. and every human being should uh, partake of this beauty because it will change them and it will give them wonderful understanding of the world. One last question. I think that we probably have only that much of time is from Anita Coles on three. She's asking, this is a loaded question. What is the importance of Shakti and Shaivism? And what is the analogy in Kundalini? So uh, just whatever you can. Beautiful question. As I mentioned uh, earlier on, when I was talking of Sri Vidya, Ultimately, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you approach uh, reality as the deity, however you view that deity based on your temperament, as the mm -hmm. sun, the outer sun, right? Mm -hmm. You're the inner sun. But yeah. you can ultimately go to the heart of the inner sun only through the processes within you mm -hmm. who are represented by Shakti. Prakriti, your Prakriti, your Shakti is you. For everybody, you, man, we, women, woman, everybody. So ultimately, the way to knowledge is only through a worship or analysis of Shakti, goddess. 
through mm. goddess that is the way <clears throat> and that's why even though in kashmir we spoke about shiva that everybody was shiva but we all worship the goddess or right. even shankaracharya who sp spoke about uh, you know advaita he also composed sandarya lahari in which he worshiped mm. the goddess so mm -hmm. ultimately the path is only through the goddess ultimately the path is through the goddess known not only in our inner being but goddess is also represented by nature, by outer reality mm -hmm. and science. So Hinduism, Kashmir Shaivism, Vedas are all pro-science because you approach science and studying science, you come, you confront paradoxes of reality, which ultimately help you transcend your earlier understanding. And that's what, as I mentioned in the beginning, is rebirth is to mm -hmm. become a different person different person yeah so shakti goddess is the way goddess is the way and we did it of course we did sharika devi uh, mm -hmm. who is a who is shiv or parvati the goddess mm -hmm. um, so durga that's the way that's the way or lakshmi Very of cool. course we also need wealth we should also well, worship yes, that we, we have to survive. <laughs> yeah. We have to go have good things in life. Right. Um, last few minutes, uh, five minutes, um, on whatever you want to talk about, Sebastian. What is your message to your message to the youth in particular? How do we engage them? And how do we get the message of our religion across? Um, so whatever you want to say about that. Well, i say two things. First of all, uh, there is a <clears throat> dictum that in order to love others, and this is true of personal life also, in order to love somebody else, you must first love yourself. In order to love the West also, and there's beautiful things in the West as well, we must first love our own culture because there's something truly beautiful about it. Only when we love ourselves, both at personal level and at cultural level, will we have the tools and the insights to truly comprehend what's beautiful in the other. No human being hating himself or herself can form a proper relationship with another human being, mm -hmm. right? For psychological health as well, that is sure. an absolute essential. So what I'll tell everybody is, if you are misinformed about Hinduism, about our own culture, and if you have questions, shoot them to us, we'll, answer them, you should be completely satisfied with, the answer, with all the answers. If there's something unsatisfactory, don't accept Hinduism because we are telling you what, what, the, what is form a right. proper understanding of it in, in your heart. Mm -hmm. If you have it, the certitude on your face would be such a powerful thing that people will be attracted to you like to a magnet. And everybody else would also want to know it because it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not something sectarian. They want to share it with everybody. Mm -hmm. There's Shiva in everybody. So, so be connected to the Shiva within you. And then the grace, the anugraha of the goddess will mm -hmm. be upon you. And you will find that you didn't know existed within you. So I have to um, honestly apologize to you and the audience today because one hour is not enough for this discussion, clearly. We do need to have many, many, many more discussions like that. There's so much to dissect, so much to talk about. And I did get, I apologize to people who sent questions on this segment, but we couldn't get to them because um, or some of the questions were all, already submitted. But certainly maybe if we have a conversation next, we'll take up these questions. So it has been an honor, a privilege to have you on and to know you. I would request perhaps that maybe we should have more of these discussions to get more people into the fold and again, ask these questions. I think you are an authority on these, you know, whatever the sciences, the Vedas, and you would be the best person to answer those questions um, and the, um, the curiosities that our youth have, that we have, um, and to expand into that um, universe. So thank you so much for being with us, Subhachi, and uh, thank you all who ever joined us. Um, I really 
appreciate all of you joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Archanaji. And uh, just by closing, uh, let me also say that I'll send a few books uh, uh, to uh, Archanaji and feel free to share them with anybody. And there thank might you. be some questions, the answers to some of the questions that you might have in those books. And then I'll be more than happy to meet with you guys again at some future time. But Absolutely. thank you once again. Really enjoyed being a part of this conversation. Thank you, Subhaji. It was a pleasure and honor. Thank you so much. And um, thank you all. Um, I do have to uh, say a couple of things. One is that um, please donate to KOA. We are running um, excellent programs. So we have so many other projects that we are a part of. And yesterday we had um, a fundraiser and we talked about the SEC, the EAP programs, the medical fund programs, um, our association with the Vitasta Hospital and um, so, so many other programs. We do wanna expand with your support. Obviously this is a membership run organization. So um, one is please be a member. Second is that please donate. Uh, we have to um, help the community. We have to rise together. We have to be, um, you know, up on the top again. Thank you so much. And uh, Uparji, if um, my time is done, if you want to take it from here. And uh, the next segment is Sharda Peet. Umesh Ji, a dear friend, is going to uh, talk about the excellent videos that the kids have produced. Uh, they were wonderful, Subhash Ji. And um, the topic was Abhinav Gupta, and the second topic was 370. Um, they submitted wonderful videos. They were really exceptional. So Umeshji is going to talk about that in the next segment. The winners, um, and he's going to do <clears throat> announce the awardees. Um, thank you again. And thank you um, uh, again to everyone. Bye. Thank you, Ashkaji, and thank you, Subhaji. It was such an enriching uh, talk to hear. Thank you. So we'll move to our next segment. Uh, that's Shardapit. Uh,